I went to a small Christian high school instead of the public high school down the street. And this meant that I had a longer drive to school and back. According to Google Maps, it should be about a 25 minute drive. Now I started to drive myself my junior year and over the, those months I turned 17 and I turned away from the good driving habits that you learn from driver's ed. And over time, it became my goal to make that 25 minute drive in under 20 minutes. That meant shaving off 20% of the drive time. So one of the ways I did that was by speeding a lot. I went 15 to 20 miles per hour over just about all of the time, but that alone wasn't enough to make up the time. Now my best chance to hit the mark of 20 minutes was going to be late at night. My school was in a growing but still small town, so there wasn't much traffic and on top of that, um, the stoplights turned off at 11 p.m. and allowed you to go straight on through if you stuck to the major roads. Fortunately, I was in the spring musical and in the week leading up to the performances, I didn't leave school till midnight almost every day. And this cleared the way for me to make the drive as quickly as possible. There was little to no traffic. I was guaranteed that I wouldn't hit a stoplight till I was halfway home and I could drive just about as fast as I wanted. Monday night, I almost made it. Tuesday, I was even closer. I just caught a stoplight or two as I got close to home. But then on Wednesday night, on Wednesday night, I finally made the drive from school to home in just under 20 minutes. And then the next morning, I got pulled over on my way to school. I got a speeding ticket for going 18 miles per hour over. Yeah, friends, classmates, and even some teachers passed me by as I sat on the side of the road getting my due. Now, these bad habits did not start the day I got my license. They built up day by day as I made worse and worse choices and got away with it. I started, I started by pushing the speed limit just one or two miles per hour at a time. I would try to beat my classmates who drove the same or similar route as me to school. When I rode with friends um, who drove recklessly, I, I then adopted some of those habits for myself. And then I noticed that I was close to making the drive in just 20 minutes and that inspired me to hit the mark. I didn't get to 18 miles per hour over the speed limit all at once. I made a bunch of choices from the time I got my license that added up and ended in a ticket. And each of our lives are made up of many simple, ordinary choices that add up over time and become habits that shape us. Tish Harrison Warren opens up her book that inspired her series, The Liturgy of the Ordinary, with this quote that lays it out well. It must be remembered that life consists not of a series of illustrious actions or elegant enjoyments. The greater part of our time passes in compliance with necessities and the performance of daily duties and the removal of small inconveniences and the procurement of petty pleasures. All sorts of small, ordinary moments add up together to shape our lives. They can move us closer and closer to our goals and aspirations. Choices to make a study plan ahead of time instead of cramming um, can become good habits for school and sets us up to pass our classes. Choices to take a break from work to spend time with our family reminds us of what is most important and moves us closer to the spouse and parent that we hope to be. As we'll explore this week in a catalyst, Choices to sit quietly and simply be with God help build rhythms in our lives that move us closer and closer to our creator. But we can also build a bad and dangerous habits as I did when I started driving on my own. We can train ourselves to need constant engagement, pulling, up, pulling out our phones and skimming Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever the moment we're bored, rendering any effort to sit still and quiet unbearable. We make subtle choices to become more selfish by focusing on, focusing on how everything affects us and never pausing to consider the person on the other side. The slow cashier at the grocery store, the woman in front of us at Starbucks taking a long time, our coworker who keeps making mistakes that we have to fix. We build lives of constant movement that never pause except when we're sitting in traffic. And that only makes us angry and frustrated. C.S. Lewis captures how dangerous the ordinary can be in the screw tape letters. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. 
through everyday, ordinary actions repeated time and time again, we can build good rituals that move us closer to God and to the people God loves. Or we can move ourselves farther along and farther down the soft, gentle slope, unaware that the ground is dropping beneath our feet until we've already gone too far down that road. As Megan asked last week, what set of repeated rituals are liturgies are forming us. For example, we have been trained for immediacy. We wake up and we immediately grab our phone. We stream and binge our television shows. We drink instant coffee and we zip through drive throughs We get two-day delivery, or if we have spent en enough, Amazon will deliver our stuff the very day. The internet brings the latest news, the newest photos and posts, the freshest con content to us now, and our greatest enemy is buffering. And for all the ways that technology has made modern life easier, it has also made us worse at waiting. Now, I have may, may have been a reckless teenage boy, but we are all guilty of that same underlying desire. We're impatient. Are we there yet? We want to get there now. We want to be done with college now. We want to get married now. We want the promotion now. We want our vacation or our break to start now. We want it now. We hate waiting. And nothing makes that more clear than traffic. When a long line of moving cars gets in between us and where we are going, traffic reminds us that we do not control the clock, that we are not the masters of time. It is humbling, but mostly it's very frustrating. People honk and yell as if that will get them, any, get them there any faster, as if they can will the cars ahead of them to move. And by people do this, maybe I mean I do this or you do this. Traffic as much as anything reminds us that we are not in control. It doesn't matter what we want, if we want it now, we have to wait. And maybe though, maybe this is a good thing. As Chish Warren writes, for the good of my own soul, I need to feel what it's like to wait, to let the moments march past, and here I am, plunged into an ancient spiritual practice in the middle of the freeway, forced against my will to practice waiting. That's an interesting thought. Can sitting in traffic be anything other than frustrating? Can waiting become liturgy? Can it somehow, some way, be an act of spiritual formation that brings us closer to God while we fail to get closer to our destination? So the question for this morning is, how can sitting in traffic become a practice that forms us rather than just an annoyance that drives us insane? And the, root, the root problem is that we are a hurried people, constantly trying to move to the next thing. But God is not in a hurry. Consider Jesus' ministry. Now, Jesus never had to deal with traffic. He simply walked everywhere or rode a donkey. Not that I imagine he minded because Jesus was not hurried in his ministry. He waited 30 years to get started. And when he did, he took his time and he didn't rush it. Even when he had opportunities early on to gain a lot of attention for his ministry. The Gospel of John records a time when Jesus was at a wedding in Cana with his mother and the wine ran out. Now, this was a big problem in their culture to run out of wine at a wedding, and that would be a great shame for the couple. However, Mary knew that her son had the power to fix it and asked Jesus to do so. But, but he replied, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Now, Mary made Jesus do it anyways, because God may be his father, but she is his mother. But that's... Not the point. As Jesus said, my time has not yet come. And the first chapter of Mark's gospel ends with another miracle when Jesus encounters a man suffering from leprosy. The man begs for healing. And moved with compassion, Jesus heals him. But after healing him, Jesus gives a peculiar command. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Now, Jesus could have gained a lot of attention for his ministry in its early days, but Jesus was in no rush to receive acclaim and fame for his miracles. His ministry wasn't hurried, but instead measured and intentional. 
And Jesus would get attention soon enough. And the man goes on to tell everyone anyways, just as Mary goes on to make Jesus perform the miracle. But at least for the moment, Jesus knew that the time had not yet come. Jesus knew the reputation he might earn from these miracles would gain him some quick followers. But he wasn't in a hurry to gain great crowds seeking his healing or seeking his miracles. He knew his ministry and his teaching would require time to build, time to teach his followers about the complete life change he was offering. And he still got those massive crowds. Tens of thousands of people would come to listen to him over the course of his ministry, seeking his miracles, looking to be fed, hoping to hear a message of revolution that would uplift the kingdom of Israel. But in the end, he only had 12, the 12 disciples and a relatively small group of followers beyond that who stayed with him. But those were the followers that he was able to spend time with, invest in, and teach about the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Israel, that he came to establish. Now, God has never been in a rush. Look at God's peculiar pattern of calling old people and acting through people who had been waiting for a very long time. Abraham was 75 years old when God called him to leave his father's home and 99 years old when God promised Sarah and him a son of their own. Moses was 80 years old when God spoke to him from a burning bush. God wasn't in a hurry. And instead of calling those people while they were still young men, God waited. And God waited on Joseph as well. When Joseph was wrongly imprisoned in Egypt after being sold into slavery by his brothers, he spent years in prison forgotten by anyone who could have helped him. But he was not forgotten by God, who used this time to shape, James, shape Joseph and grow him from a very immature young man into an incredible leader and faithful servant who was able to forgive his brothers who had betrayed him and sold him into slavery in the first place. God's purposes are always accomplished, but they're accomplished in God's own unhurried time. As Peter writes to those anxiously awaiting the end of days and Christ's second coming, God's time is different than ours. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Just as we worship an unheard God, we should be people of waiting. This was built into, into the traditions of worship and celebration of the ancient Israelites. God gave extensive instructions for the preparation that must precede sacrifices, festivals, celebrations, and worship. This built in a period of waiting before celebration, a pause before the feast. This unhurried pace shaped God's people. Going back to Noah after the flood, before moving forward, they would pause to build an altar as a monument to what God had done for them a reminder of miraculous deliverance, divine communication, or amazing promise. This pattern of preparation before celebration and pause before praise continues in the modern church. In the church calendar, we have seasons of waiting and preparation before Christmas and Easter with Advent and Lent. And we get a double dose of that leading up to Easter as we observe Holy Week in the days before the celebration. And then there's the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday a breath between death and life. Imagine waiting for Jesus' followers on that day. Now, on the other hand, our culture rushes from celebration to celebration. And this rush is so well captured by Target's seasonal section. Christmas has hardly passed before the stores put up their Valentine's Day sales. And then it's on to Easter and spring, followed by the 4th of July and summer. And while we're still in the middle of summer, back to school stuff pops back up. And then it's Halloween, and then it just skips over Thanksgiving entirely and goes straight to Christmas again before we know it. But as Christians, we are meant to stand out from the culture around us. And in one such way that we are designed to be different is as people of waiting. The Israelites waited to enter the promised land. They waited for their Messiah to come for God's promise to be fulfilled. We wait for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done on earth. Tish Warren described Christians like this. Christians are people who wait. We live in liminal time, 
in the already and not yet. Christ has come and he will come again. We dwell in the meantime. We wait. To be fair, as we talk about waiting for Christmas, that's one thing. Waiting in traffic is another. It's hard to wait in traffic because traffic is terrible. It feels endless. It keeps us from our destination. It's just plain uncomfortable sitting stuck in our cars as our butts and backs start to hurt and we start to feel restless and suddenly need to pee. Now, God forbid you ever have to sit in traffic with children in the car. It's much easier to wait, for example, in a comfy chair with a free drink and my phone in hand, like when I wait for a haircut at my barber shop. But we want to escape traffic. We want to escape lines. We want to escape waiting rooms. We want to escape the unpleasant and uncomfortable places that we are made to wait. Waiting on God in this world can also be unbearable. We're waiting on God to reveal our purposes to us. We're waiting on God to answer our prayers. Most of all, the world is broken, and we are waiting for God to fix it. But we can't just escape the world. We cannot just opt out, although many Christians do try. Waiting in traffic is like waiting for God to make things right for the work God does in us and in our world. It feels uncomfortable. It feels endless. We are on our way, but not yet there. We are in the in-between. But Paul writes that there is hope in that way, because even though we cannot see our destination, we have assurance that it is coming. So we wait and we hope as he writes in Romans. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. As Christians, our wait is not unbearable, but hopeful. We know the kingdom is coming. We know that one day we will be wrapped up in God's arms and the brokenness of the world and ourselves will be restored. It's like sitting in traffic on the way home. It's a different kind of waiting than traffic anywhere else. And it, be, and it can become so much more bearable if we just remember that we will get home no matter how long we wait. However, this, this is not wasted time. God does not do nothing while we wait. Rather, our wait is purposeful. Tish Warren uses the metaphor of a fallow field, a field that is being plowed but not cultivated by the farmer, a field that is waiting. God is at work in us and through us as we wait. Our waiting is active and purposeful. A fallow field is never dormant. As dirt sits waiting for things to be planted and grown, there is work being done invisibly and silently. Microorganisms are breeding, moving, and eating. Wind and sun and fungi and insects are dancing a delicate dance that leavens the soil, making it richer and better, readying it for planting. And while the field sits, nature does its work, restoring and revitalizing. While we sit with God, God does work in us so that we, like the field, are ready to produce good crops. Jesus demonstrates how our waiting should look in a parable of bridesmaids waiting for the bridegroom to come in Matthew 25. Ten were there, but only five prepared and brought enough oil to keep their lamps lit into the night. As the ten waited for the bridegroom to come, the five foolish bridesmaids' oil ran out, but the five who were prepared did not have enough to share. The five left to buy more. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. The bridesmaids prepared themselves that, so that they can now sit and wait and respond to the bridegroom well. They were in a space where they could simply sit and wait. Now we wait with purpose and preparation. We sit ready to respond to our groom, to Christ himself. The kingdom is coming. The feast awaits us. All will be made right. But we are in a time of waiting, of preparing ourselves and our place. We are oriented to our future hope, yet we do not try to escape from our present reality. We are never quite comfortable. We seek justice, patience, mercy, and herald the kingdom to come. Ms. Tishwaran summarizes it. 
Now to become people of waiting, we need to start by considering the practices that we engage in as they form us. How do we practice waiting? How do we make use of the times that we are forced to wait? And how can we t use our times of waiting not to frustrate us, but to instead bring us closer to God? One thing I would encourage is this week then is to start intentionally and do something unhurried this week. Walk somewhere instead of drive. Intentionally wait in a longer line, sit in traffic, or just drive a little slow. Go three miles per hour under the speed limit. If you're worried about all the extra time that this will take, then just prepare for it. Leave, leave a little earlier. Give yourself a little more time. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. And use this unhurried time to prepare yourself. Start by embracing the discomfort of waiting. Now, while there are things that we can actively do and, and should do with preparing the way for God's kingdom prepare, for preparing ourselves while we wait, it starts with just being able to wait for God. We need to allow everything we do to come out of unhurried communion with God instead of just doing things for God. So during this unhurried time of preparation, do nothing. Doing nothing is the point. Instead, take this waiting, take this unhurried time and spend it with God. Limit your distractions. Don't take out your phone. Don't fiddle with the car radio. Just wait. And instead, notice your thoughts, your emotions, and your surroundings. Reach out and seek God's presence. And finally, the next time you're forced to wait, instead of grumbling, thank God for that opportunity. Practice patience. Practice sitting. Practice silence by not adding to the noise around, but by sitting still and simply listening. Let God begin to form you into someone who is able to sit and wait in the in-between. You know, my story from before doesn't end with my speeding ticket. It continues two days later. Saturday night was the final performance of the school play and the cast celebrated by going out to Red Robin. So it was another late night by the time I was headed home, but at least I was no longer trying to break the 20 minute mark and I was no longer speeding. Still, I was exhausted from the long week and I fell asleep just five minutes from home. I hit the median, went into a bush and flipped my car. I managed to land right side up, but was barely aware of what just happened. And here's what the car looked like afterwards. The ambulance came. I got out of the car on my own power and onto the stretcher. I was taken in an ambulance to the hospital where my very distraught but grateful that I was alive parents met me. After the tests and exams told me that I was okay, more than okay, really all I had injured was a scratch on my head. And my parents, so my parents and I sit there in the emergency room and reflected on the miracle that we had experienced. It wasn't only that I was unharmed by the crash, but that the speeding ticket I'd got just two days earlier slowed me down substantially. That ticket very possibly saved my life. I got this sense as I sat there from God, telling me to slow down, to pay attention. God has greater things in store for me. So I slowed down. I listened. I followed God to Arizona and Damascus Road. I followed God to ministry instead of engineering. Last fall, I followed God and started seminary, which will be a long five-year process. But I don't know what is yet to come, if there is more or not. So I'm still waiting. And you may be too. So let us wait and prepare for the celebration that is to come. Let us wait unhurried and instead patiently dwelling with God. Let us wait with hope because we will make it home no matter how long we sit in traffic.